remember for 57 days straight, I prepared my own meals wow. and I got to meet my farmers and they had drive by a uh, farmer's market. And that was the first time that I got to get out here in my community and meet personally, shake their hand and learn about mushrooms and herbs and how to cook this and how to do that. Oh, it was the 2020, the pandemic was like a blessing to me. Yeah. You know, it was it was bad for some and we lost a lot of people, but mm -hmm. it was a uh, eye opener. I, I never knew about Tab. My sister tried to show me about Tabitha Brown, but I thought she was funny. But then, you know, she became my best friend because all I had was my laptop, you know, on my yeah. cell phone. And I'm on this journey. And so let me see what she's doing. And boy, I mean, and she skyrocketed. I mean, she was just like a nobody to yeah. she's now America's mom. Yeah. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Eat Realty Heal podcast. You know me, I'm your host, Nicolette Richet, and I just want to start out by saying how grateful I am to all of the listeners we have from the 87 plus countries from around the world that listen to our show. There is a nothing that I love more than while helping clients learn how to eat real to heal to completely reverse their chronic diseases and get off meds. But it's also interviewing these incredible guests that we have on our show. Now on today's show, we have a woman that has touched my heart so deeply. She reached out to me and she said, uh, and I don't even remember what she reached out to me for, but she just said, you know, could we chat? Could we connect? I'd love to learn more about, um, do you, do you all hear the blending in the background that I'm up working upstairs in our office and the sound in this office is not conducive to podcasting. We have a series of plant-based, um, restaurants called the green mustache here in British Columbia, Canada, and we serve hundred percent organic plant-based whole food, but as I'm here, I'm not set up with my microphone, which I normally am, or with our sound system. So I'm hoping this comes to you okay. But anyway, let's get back to Kina. So Kina reached out to me, this beautiful woman from the United States, and she said, you know, I just want to help more people. I want to help people use food as medicine. And so, of course, I had to get on the phone with her when I heard that. And of course, I'm going to support her in any which way that she um, that she needs to be able to do that. And then, of course, she proceeds to tell me the most incredible story after story after story after story, which is why I knew I had to have her on the podcast immediately. I'm like, the world needs to know about this powerhouse of a woman who is doing incredible things to heal her community. She healed herself. She's helping children heal so I'm so excited to bring her onto the show and so you can listen to her story. Now, Kina Washington, she's the owner of Dora Catherine's Catering Company and Private Chef Services, which serves the DC metro area. The name is derived from her grandmothers, Dora Morris and Catherine Washington, who she cooked alongside since she was eight years old. I love that she is really tapped into her um, family, her heritage that you know holding those memories strong because in today's world where we are losing languages cultural identity we're losing literally everything um, as we come become more homogenized well Kina is hanging on to that and sharing those gifts with the world so Kina earned her associate's degree in professional cooking and food services management and her passion has always been cooking teaching and serving others. So of course, I hold such a warm, dear place in my heart for her. Now you're going to learn about Kina's health scare that she had and how she ended up on her own doing her own research amongst a horrific medical system that is in the United States that often leaves most people who have chronic diseases, leaves them getting worse and worse and worse, um, puts them on more meds, on more meds, and on even more meds resulting in surgery. And then of course, a shorter lifespan. Kina has lost many loved ones in her life due to chronic disease. You're going to hear all about that and what she's doing to change the medical system to bring health back into the sick care system as we know it. 
So learn about everything she's up to. Listen to this podcast and you know what to do. At the end of the show, please, please, please share this podcast with others because I know you know someone in your life that is battling a chronic degenerative disease and they need to know about Kina Washington's story, how a, a citizen of the United States who doesn't have the science background, who's not a medical doctor, who isn't, you know, a health practitioner, if a professional, you know, with a professional designation, as we know it, the kind of people we put up on pedestals for all the answers around our health. She is a citizen of the United States who did her own research and managed to reverse her own chronic diseases. So if she can do it, you can do it. Okay. But it takes wanting to challenge the system. It takes wanting to know more about the human body, about health. It takes wanting to experiment in a very safe way. You're using food. So experiment and sticking to something that gets results. Okay. And then to going one step further, which is what I love about Kina is she shares everything she knows with the world. And that's what we all need to be doing. We need to be sharing this priceless information with others. So welcome Kina to the podcast. And before we continue, let me just tell you about a program that Kina just registered in with us. It's called our Nutrition and Detox Coaching Certification Program. It's a six month program where I teach you everything I've come to learn over the past 25 years the science of metabolic nutrition, the art of nutritional medicine. So you can teach that to others, to your clients, to your patients, to your yoga students, to your students in any capacity, to your family members, your friends, or even just for yourself. You can teach them how to reverse chronic disease. You do not need a science background. You do not need to uh, know about any of that, I will teach it to you. I will teach you the science of reversing chronic disease so you can help your clients, patients, and students get results once and for all. I've trained physicians and naturopaths and chiropractic doctors and, and, um, and PTs and dietitians and nutritionists, yoga instructors, and moms and dads. And so you can sign up for this program. We're running our next cohort July 11th in it's all online live and it's a six month program there goes the blenders again can you hear them the last half of the program so three months of learning the science of reversing chronic disease and three months of learning exactly how to start a business if you don't already have a business or to launch an existing business scale it um sorry launch a new business or scale a your existing business. That's what I meant to say. I've been talking a lot today. We just launched another course today, but I'll tell you about that after. So with our nutrition and detox coaching certification, you will become a certified coach. So you can open your own business, scale an existing business and start helping people heal. This is all part of our 22 million strong campaign to build an army of healers in the world who know exactly how to support um, individuals in reversing chronic disease. So we can help 22 million people collectively by 2030 reverse their diagnosed chronic conditions because 97% of chronic diseases are reversible. And currently we have 58% of North Americans that are living with a diagnosed chronic disease that is reversible. So yeah, you can sit back, watch Netflix. You can keep you know working in your job, come home, relax, you know, keep eating processed food. You can drink beer to wind down at night or wine to wind down at night, drink coffee to wake up in the morning, keep eating those processed ingredients the next day. Keep doing that. Keep feeding your children in this unhealthy way so that they grow up to feed their children in, in these unhealthy ways, or you can step up. You can learn about our program. We have a webcast running next week on June 15th. So head over to our website um, so you can sign up for that masterclass. I'll be teaching you and all the things that we'll be teaching in the nutrition and detox coaching session. You can answer questions, figure out if this program is right for you and sign up. So without further ado, here is Kina Washington to warm your hearts just as she warmed mine. See you at the end, everyone. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Eat Real to Heal podcast. I'm your host, Nicolette Richet, and on today's episode, we are going to be discussing so many beautiful things with the wonderful Kina Washington. Welcome, Kina, to our show. Thank you. It's so great to be here. I'm so excited. And so great to have you here as well, because I know that this is your first podcast that you have been on as a guest, but I can't believe that because you have so many incredible gifts to share with the world. So I just am so thrilled that you are here today with me. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed and uh, highly favored to be here. I'm, I'm so excited. So yeah, I'm so excited too, because when you, re- so I don't even remember how we got connected. Like you had, did you reach out to me? Did I reach out to you? I can't even remember what happened. So I reached out to you. So I watched you on the physician committee. So I watched the physician committee. I was watching it on a weekly basis before I became a foster mother. Mm-hmm. And so then I saw your face and I said, look, look at this. I said, I've never seen a black woman on the physician committee. So <laughs> I clicked on it. <laughs> I clicked on it and I, I listened to your story and then I just went on a deep dive with you and I clicked on your um, page and then I clicked on the green mustache and then I clicked on your your uh, university, your certifications and then it says do a 30 minute Zoom to learn more about it and oh, yeah. I chose a date and then I was at work and I got a text message that said that you're 15 minutes late and I was like, to what? <laughs> so then I clicked on it and I totally forgot because now I have these, I became yeah. an instant mom and and I completely, everything is all out of whack and I click on it and I'm thinking it's going to be, you know, like um, click the video, watch a, you know, a video mm. or it's going to be a ton of people on a Zoom and it's going to be a recording or something and to see you was like seeing Oprah. Like Oprah. <laughs> Like I was, I was so blown. I couldn't believe that you were actually gonna be doing the Zoom. Like you have a whole team and like tons of restaurants, and you're a mother of three and a wife, and you know everything. I just yeah. could not believe it was gonna be you to talk to me. And I remember I was driving around the circle, and you was like, "Stop and just breathe." <laughs> I was just overwhelmed. I was so overwhelmed. And then, you know, in our 15 minutes, we just hit so many things. And then for you to tell me that you would be honored for me to talk to me, like me, like I'm nobody. (laughs) Oh my gosh. No, the very, very, very opposite. And this is why the minute you started telling your story, I was like, we need to get your story out to the world. And I think that is so I'll take the Oprah thing. God, I love that woman. I've watched so many of her shows. She's yeah. helped so many of the people. So I'm going to, I'm going to take that, but you too, you're like out there and you're literally doing the work. So just so everybody understands how this went down, like uh, Kina, when you got on the phone and on the zoom call, you were like, I'm so sorry, I'm late, but I just adopted these foster kids. Like you had just brought that, like they had just arrived and I was blown away that you were even on the call. I was like, what are you doing on this call? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I think so I was on my way to court. You were I on, think the- I was on my way to court or I had to pick them up by a certain time. I can't remember. Like oh, it was yeah. something like really major. And I was just talking to you on my way to in the car. Yeah. In the car <laughs> yeah, kind of, with Wi-Fi cutting in and out, but but it was what you said in that time, like you adopted the, like you brought on these kids, these beautiful, you brought into your home to give them a loving home. We were just talking about it before the show. Um, that in itself is amazing. You know, we need more foster parents out there who are loving and kind like you um, and, you know, giving these kids a reprieve, a break and something incredible. Not only that, but you are a plant-based chef as well. Not only that, but then you told me about um, the fact that you healed yourself through food, which is what this show is all about. Like I, you know, go around looking for people who have the courage to stand up and say, you know what, enough is enough with these medications. Like medications play a place, but in in the world until you can discover that food is medicine, but you went out there and you did all that. So that's what we are here to talk about as well. So let's, let's go back. Let's go back. So tell me about the work that you do with, you know, your, your government, you're working with the federal government. Is yes, that correct? I work for the I work for the VA, 
and I'm a, a chef there at the VA out here in West Virginia. So I provide them with, um, I was providing dinner, but I had to switch my schedule due to becoming an instant mom, uh, yeah. foster parent um, a couple months ago. So that's been an, uh, an adjustment, but I, I started cooking when I was very young. I, I just uh, always had a passion for cooking and couponing. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Since I was little, my, my aunt told me before I could even talk, she says I would be clipping coupons <laughs> and standing up at the at the stove, like helping and assisting. And and I remember as a little young kid, it was Yan Can Cook and um uh I remember uh Julia Childs, and that was all you had was like um uh, public broadcasting channel and um my Louisiana man, I can't remember his name, Justin. And so I would just take all of their recipes and every anniversary or birthdays, I would invite people, all of my aunts and uncles over and I would cook from the time like seventh grade. My wow. mother was a baker, so she had me to bake. And I knew I didn't want to be a baker because every day she had me baking a cake my whole summers. And I never got a dollar. She never <laughs> gave me a dollar, but <laughs> I was baking. And so then um, school was never like my thing. But uh, when when I became a senior, they started to open up all of these uh, new culinary programs in high school and like food and technology. So I started taking all these culinary programs and I got into the Baltimore International Culinary College. So I graduated high school at 16 and went to uh, Baltimore. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, so hold on. So you went from school not being your thing to graduating high school at 16. How did that work out? Uh, good. I mean, I, I, I passed. <laughs> it's 16. Like most people are graduating when they're 18. So you not only, you know, school wasn't your thing, but you just decided to speed it up. Is that what you did? I don't know what my, I don't know how it happened. Cause I, wow. I, was, I don't, I don't know how it happened because I was born with uh, epilepsy. Okay. So I had learning delays when yeah. I was younger. And so like, I would be like in, uh, my reading would be second grade, but my math and other things would be third grade and all of that kind of stuff. So I had some, it was always some difficulty learning, but I was really good. I love science mm -hmm. and I love English and history. So those mm -hmm. were my, but math was never my subject. I thought that I, one day I was going to be a doctor, but when I learned that I had to work with rodents and <laughs> I said, it's not for me, <laughs> I am absolutely terrified of rodents, but you know, cooking is, I want it's my passion. It's my gift. Like I can, I can stand on my feet for like 19 hours and cook all day, Wow! And, but I don't want to sit behind a computer for no more than an hour. Like yeah. I just, yeah. Well, this is the thing is our school systems need to be redesigned to really look at, you know, where, where are people's gifts and also they're, you know, physically, what do they love to do? Like even just asking someone, do you love to sit behind a computer or do you love to stand on your feet all day long? That would instantly, you know, take people in two different directions. Right. So, you know, I don't mind being, I love being behind my computer. Like my kids know that my computer is, you know, the one thing that, <laughs> I love more than anything else, but, but, and it's what I love. And I don't love being on my feet cooking at all. My husband does all the cooking. So, you know, you and I would actually make a really good team, like running a restaurant together. And yeah. so, um, but that is exactly how my husband is. He doesn't love the computer, loves being on his feet. And if we could like just change our education system right? To just figure out like, where, where do your gifts lie? What are your passions? How do you love to move your body? Um, we, like our education system would be so different. We'd have men like happier kids all around as you've, you know, eventually got to experience when they opened up all these culinary schools. Absolutely. And I remember I was listening to one of your podcasts and you said your daughter create their school. They make the science book. Like they don't, yes. they're not giving a book, but they create the book. And I was like, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing amazing because that that because that would be easier for me to learn I just always remember when I was in school I was always a day be a day late so like whatever math problems we was working on like I got it the next day right. I never got it that day <laughs> you know it would and, take yeah 
but you, but you know, public school system. My parents worked two jobs. Um, yeah you know, it was, it was what it was. So. Yeah. And definitely, I mean, the education system in the United States and Canada, we rank like so low compared to so many other um, countries, developed countries out there. And it's ridiculous because we in Canada, and the U S we put more money into our education and healthcare systems, but we rank the lowest in education and health. And this is absurd. So I am so glad that you found your passion and it really is an innate passion, like something you've had since you were so little. So then you graduated 16 and 16 is like we consider that young in this day and age to graduate from high school. Then you went into the world of culinary arts. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I went to culinary arts school in Baltimore, about 30 minutes from the DC area. That's where I grew up at. And so I, our dorms was a hotel. So we owned this hotel and like the top, like five floors was the dormitories and it was co-ed and um, you know, it was a, different kind of experience being so young I don't yeah. Get... <laughs> yeah it was nice but it was nice to have my my parents not too far away so they became like the dorm parents and they would bring us uh, meals on Sundays and she, they would bring my laundry back and all of that kind of stuff awesome. <laughs> so it was a it was a good experience so as I was so one of my roommates uh, became like, she's like a sister to me. And so she had to leave, but every, when we were there, when she was there, she lived in New York city. So every weekend we would go down to Baltimore city and get on the Greyhound and take the bus every Friday and come back every Sunday. So when I was getting ready to graduate from culinary school, I said, I'm moving to New York when I graduate. Wow. Had no plan, no idea how I was going to do it. So I was working for Ori- for the Baltimore Orioles, um, grilling outside doing um, ribs and chicken. And so this man walked up to me, very drunk, eating the ribs. And he was like, did you make these ribs? And I said, yes, sir. He says, how would you like to come and be my chef at my resort in New York? This is two weeks before I'm graduating from culinary <laughs> school. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. Don't yes, have sir, no of idea. course. We're in New York, we're going, nothing. But I just kept on saying that I'm moving to New York when I graduate from college. And so my father uh, wanted to see where I was going to be going. And, and so we, we went. He drove, I want to say it was 10, 12 hours away. We drove all the way up there. He wanted to see the, what the resort looked like. We ate. We got back in the car. He drove back. And... We, he went to work. He went straight to work that morning. <laughs> that morning. So he, he just wanted to see where his child was going to be staying yeah. at. And, and so they you did, you made the move. Me. Yeah. And they allowed me to, they told me all I needed was a TV and um, a suitcase. And they allowed me to bring my 15 year old little cousin to come up there with me for the summer. Uh, and she was going to clean the whole, the, the room. It ended up being it wasn't a resort. It was like a campground. Yeah. And uh, like on the side of the road. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a very interesting experience. Uh, wow. I was so far in the mountains. I was an hour away from Montreal, Canada. Oh, wow. I was so deep in the mountains that I had to pay $3 a month for basic television. Wow. For, and, yeah. Just for, just to see the news. And uh, it was, it was an experience. I, I didn't see nobody that looked like me oh, for yeah. eight months. What do you mean? There was no black people. Just all, oh, so it was like for all, yeah, white yes. people who can afford to go to this resort in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, Lake yeah. Placid, Lake Placid, wow. uh, where there's a lot of rich people. I mean, yep. met the best people. I had the best experience. I wouldn't trade it in for the world. Yeah. Um, I stayed up there for two years. And then wow. my grandfather uh, um, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and he was get, going missing. And I'm, you know, 12 hours away. And that was like, I was like, I'm coming back home. Yeah. And that's what came back home. Yeah. So this is amazing. You're like the ultimate manifester. I'm, I don't know how I'm going to get to New York, but I'll get to New York. And somebody comes up to you and says, 
I'll come to my to New York and cook. Yeah, at our resort. Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. So, at the time when you went to culinary school, though, like you, this is the opposite of being a plant based chef, which you are now. Yeah. Right. So you yeah. knew about. Um, you know, like, so the foods you were cooking that you love to cook at the time, you were also eating these foods as well, right? Yes. Yes. So, okay. So, yes. Yeah. So in culinary school, we learn how to, you know, uh, purchase meats, uh, how to debone and fillet and break down whole ducks and chickens and a whole um, cow and mm-hmm. all of that kind of stuff. And I remember in nutrition class, I remember her saying that it was something to the effect like one piece of uh, like a piece of gum will stay in your stomach for like seven years and like one piece of chicken uh takes all these years to break down and all this kind of stuff and i and i stopped eating pork and chicken immediately like so they're teaching you this in culinary school in the nutrition class but also that's basically all you're like you're predominantly learning how to cook meat Mm mm-hmm Wow. And I said, I don't, I, I, I didn't eat no more. I was done. I was done. And then I remember the mad cow disease came out in 96 and people was losing their brain cells and Oprah was on trial and nobody knew where their meat was coming from. Yeah. I haven't touched a piece of meat since. Like it don't take, I don't need to lose a brain cell. You don't yeah. have to, you don't have to force me to try to no. know yeah. <laughs> after just hearing that. And it made me more conscious. Uh, right. where, where my food comes from, what, what am I eating? What am I putting in my body? And it, uh, no, I mean, I hear people say, well, I need me a good piece of steak every once. Mm-mm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so, but you didn't grow up in a family that was eating predominantly vegetarian, did you? Or what was that like growing up in the foods you ate? So my father was meat and potatoes and my mother was, my mother grew up in a, um, a dirt road country uh, in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So she lived off the land. So they, they had pigs and cows and chickens and they had uh, gardens and everything was canned. Like my grandmother, like the whole entire basement was completely covered in shelves with you pull back the curtain and it's all just canned vegetables and stuff. My mother never canned. She can't cook a pot of beans. (laughs) (laughs) But she can bake. She can bake. Right. But cooking is not her, not her thing. But she can bake. Now my father, he grew up. Well, he was born in Virginia. Grew up in D.C. And um, but his his roots and his his all the men on his side can cook. All the right. men, all the women, amazing cooks. Like go oh, down. And so my father was like the Mister Mom. So he did all of the cooking, and he loved pork chops, and he loved. Mm-hmm. Um, he loved all meats, all meats. And then my mother, because of her growing up on the land, she could eat a pot of greens and you make a piece of some fresh cornbread and she's good. Like she, right. she, she didn't need meat. And, and, you know, both of them come from a family of seven. So they didn't, uh, seven brothers and sisters, seven, five or seven brothers and sisters and then the parents. And um, so my mother just loves vegetables. So we, I, I grew to love all vegetables oh, good. And, and, and all meats, but um, yeah, but she don't have to have meat. My mother to this day, yeah. if she will eat, she can eat greens and, and cornbread and be fine. <laughs> well, it's the same with my mom and dad. Like, you know, the, now my dad eats pretty much mostly vegetables. I think he's been influenced for sure by his kids um, and my mom. But like, you know, we were born in Africa in a tiny little village where, you know, it's mud huts, thatch roofs, everybody grows their food. You pray that it's going to rain because otherwise there's going to be a drought. And then when it does rain, usually it's floods that washes away everything. You All those, the rows you just sowed or you, everybody just sowed. And, um, and so it's really like living off the land. But again, it's like, even the word living off the land is interesting what that means between, for example, your dad, who's like, loves the meat and your mom, who's like, great with the vegetables and cornbread right like both of them come technically from the land but it's 
when you pull it from the land, it's like, what do you do with it? But also the quantities of, of what you're consuming. Are you eating more meat or more vegetables? Or even when I lived in the States, you know, I went there on a tennis scholarship to Mississippi. And so, you know, I gained 25 pounds in the first semester I was there because even though I was eating mostly vegetables, everything was covered in butters and oils and really rich, rich food where, you know, if we're talking about, you know, especially being black, being African, like my grandmother in Africa never even saw a bag of oil until she was like 91 years old. Like there's no oil because there's nothing to press oil in the middle of nowhere. And so there's no butter. There's like, you just basically cook in water. Right. And, but the food is so flavorful. It's incredible, but it's just completely different way of living from the land as well. You know, so we have these three different versions between your mom, your dad, my grandma. And of course my mom's pulled in the same way. Cause my dad, you know, often would be like, I want me, we need meat on the table. So I want, cause I know you, we're going to get into this, your, your incredible story of healing yourself. But when you were growing up, like was health ever part of the conversation in relationship to food? No, no. So my parents were like skinny. Like my father could still put on his, his jeans from high school. And he was so proud of that. Like my father was super fit and uh, always moving and, and everything. And my mother, she, I never seen my mother to this day drink a glass of water. I've never seen her to this day, take a walk, pick up a exercise. I've never seen her do it. I've never seen her do it. She's about to be 70. Wow. <laughs> She's always been slim. And so then we were these over, overweight kids, you know, right. and so my father would put us on a diet every Monday and by Friday, but he worked in a grocery store. And so the sales start on Friday and every Friday we was back off this diet because he didn't brought in the newest, latest food in the grocery store. And so, um, but he tried his best. He tried yeah. his best to try and make us, you know, healthy, but it, it was just very difficult when you had a, a grandmother who, you know, just, you know, always feeding you, feeding you, feeding mm. you, always, you know, uh, giving you that food and then they felt fat as flavor. I remember when I was in culinary school and I had boneless skinless was not a thing. It wasn't popular. <laughs> and I remember trying to offer my grandma, my mother's mother from North Carolina, some boneless skinless. He, she was like, where's the fat? Where's the skin? I'm not eating that. There's no flavor in it, you right. know? And so that that's, uh, you know, always, you know, keeping that, that jar of of bacon grease on the stove, right? Or that ham grease, and then you got to add that that fat to everything. Like fat, right. fat is like fat is king, um, and it was just so it's so bad, <laughs> it's so bad. And so my father used to just always call me bougie. He used to, when he didn't use the word bougie back then. He used to just say, you know, I had a um, a, a caviar caviar appetite uh on a <laughs> peanut butter and jelly budget <laughs> but that's how I've all I've always uh been like that I've always right. yeah yeah so um but and so, what, so one question I had with the with you being in culinary school like was it it was really obviously influenced by French cuisine cooking then Yes. Yeah. Yes. A lot of French cuisine cooking. And then they did a little Mediterranean, a little Spanish, um, but a lot of French, a lot of butter, right. a lot of, um, a lot of salt, a lot. I had never had only bread I ever had was my grandmother made the, this. Now I'm, when I say grandmother, I'm talking about my grandmother, North Carolina, whenever you came over there, if we arrived in North Carolina at two in the morning, six in the evening, there was a basket of biscuits that she had hand rolled and cut with the glass sitting on the stove or on the counter in a dish towel. Wow. Like always. So bread was at every meal. They believed yeah. in uh, starch, a vegetable, and a meat for every meal, even breakfast. So oh. even if you didn't have uh, grits I mean, or something, you had grits, you had oatmeal, you or you had rice with butter and sugar, and, yeah. you, had, and you had sliced tomatoes and on the side and it was biscuits. So when I went to culinary school, only thing I knew was biscuits, cornbread and sliced white bread. 
and then I'm making breads, like I'm making focaccia and mm. bean bread and buns and baguettes and I'm like croissants. <laughs> I had never had these kind of, you know, made them from scratch. So it was just like a whole new world. And then me baking cakes since I was in the seventh grade, I never knew that you're supposed to weigh cakes out on a balance beam. Like all of the cakes in my recipe book, in the culinary books was ounces and weights and pounds. And you had a, a scale. And so it, everything had to be precise in the, in the weather outside and the temperature. It was... I was happy I didn't do baking in culinary school because it, it was yeah. nothing like home baking. No. Yeah. So different. So different. Mm -hmm. So then, okay. So, and with your family growing up, like did, um, were there illnesses? Because we know that, especially in black communities, you know, diabetes, heart disease, um, four to eight times higher rates, um, prevalence and not because genetically, you know, we are different. It's just that also we have lack, lack of access to a lot of good quality food. So just for anybody who's listening and who thinks like, oh, it's genetically, um, you know, black people get higher rates. It's not, it's because of our access to food being pushed off the land, stemming way back from colonization and slavery. Um, but you know, what was that like with amongst your family members and, and just yes, disease rates? Helped. Yes, I just had a conversation. I said, diabetes is not hereditary, it's generational. Exactly. Like, it's, yeah, we're just continuously eating what we've been taught to eat, like what we, what we, what's familiar, yeah. you know, and we're not changing it and we're, and we're getting the same results. Yeah. So my grandma, my dad's mother passed away from, um, so I was in the third grade when she passed away and I, st I lived with her until she passed my grandparents until she passed away because my parents both worked two jobs mm. and so um that's where I stayed at but she died from diabetes and I found out stomach cancer and I didn't know that until recently mm. also stomach cancer so but yeah so she she had diabetes she died at like 54 55 so, so young yeah. And I didn't think that that was young because my grandmother walked around in house dresses, like with the snaps down the front. And now that I see 54, I'm like, that's pretty young. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. You know, yeah. but you know, back then my grandmother was well settled in yeah. <laughs> at 54. And then my, um, my mother's father died from uh, esophageal cancer. And then her mother died from heart disease mm -hmm. and lupus. And my mother has lupus and fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what else. And then mm -hmm. um, my brother has um, uh, autoimmune uh, with his hands, uh, osteo osteoarthritis, I think, yeah. or yeah. something like that. And then my sister had diabetes when she was in high school or middle school. And um, my dad died from a rare brain disorder in 2018. Oh, and so it sad. just goes on and on. And my mother's brother uh, brother died from diabetes. I think all of her brothers have died and her sister have diabetes. Yeah. And a lot of, it's a lot of them that have diabetes. And I get, since I've been on this journey since 2019, I get a lot of calls, text messages, emails, Kina, can you help me? Kina, can you help mm -hmm. me? And, you know, as soon as I tell them I'm not eating no meat, you got to stop eating meat and mm -hmm. you got to get rid of, stop the dairy. And I know it's going to be hard and I know it's going to be a transition, but what, what you have in your refrigerator and your freezers and your cabinet, don't buy it no more. Mm -hmm. Eat it up, but don't buy it no more. And that's the best, that's how I did it. And that's how you can do it. You know, mm -hmm. don't, don't, throw, don't go from zero to 60. Don't, don't throw the stuff away. Don't waste your money, yeah. but just don't, don't buy it again. After yeah. it's gone, that'd be your last meal. Just, you know, pray over it and, and just say goodbye to it. <laughs> Well, and that's the thing is like what you said is that it is, you know, these illnesses. And I mean, almost, it sounds like almost everybody in your family has been touched, right? By these lifestyle chronic illnesses that are related to our 
diet, our lifestyle. And for sure, stress plays a big part for sure. Um, you know, there's environmental toxins that play a big part, but nothing plays a bigger part than our diet. And, you know, just so people know, uh, there's so many people who say, well, you know what, colonization, slavery, um, you know, coming in and taking land away from First Nations, Indigenous peoples, like that happened so long ago, but it still plays the biggest role in where we are today. Because when you look at the way my grandmother lives, and she lives exactly like Indigenous people lived here, like 92 years old, never really had a disease her whole life, no medications. Um, she, you know, ate directly from the land, real food. She ate what was in season, didn't saturate it with all of the stuff you're taught to put on food in culinary school, which is like the salt, the fat, the butters, the dairy, the high meat consumption. She ate meat like maybe when somebody died and one pig would feed or one goat or one sheep or one chicken would feed the entire village, which was sometimes like 70 people. So it was more for flavoring if it was used at all and everything else was just real food. So people have to understand, you know, and I don't know how, how we help people do that unless we just keep having conversations like this, which is storytelling to help people understand that relationship between diet and disease, but you are living proof, right? Cause you started going down that path too, when you had symptoms showing up. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so tell us about that. Yeah. So I, um, so 20, 2016 is when I started having complications. Like I, I remember it really started in June of 2016, July, we had a family reunion. And I remember after the reunion, I kept running back and forth because I was setting up all the food and getting all the food together. And I just remember limping and I would just be standing and then my leg would just give out or I'll be holding a pan and my hand would just drop whatever was in the pan. And and I was like, this is so not normal. And then uh, I would just kept going to the doctors and my, my primary care doctor just couldn't figure out what was going on. And we're doing mm -hmm. MRIs and he's checking my legs and we're doing hand scans and we're doing x-rays and uh, having heart palpitations. And I thought I was having a stroke and all types of stuff. And it was nonstop until he said, so then they finally did blood work and he sent me to a, a rheumatoid arthritis specialist and they did the blood work and I was off, they, whatever off the charts is, like I was over 800 or something on the RA scale. And then he was like, you never have to see another doctor but me. And so 2016, and then he put me on like 600, 800, um, 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 what is it, steroids? And I was taking steroids like three, four times a day for, I want to say for about two years, I was wow. on a lot of steroids and I was still in a lot of pain. Like I would be walking and then I would just look like I have a peg leg and I would just have to be dragging my leg. Mm. And it got to the point that, um, that I was going to be leaving out of the kitchen because I was having to get people to assist me pulling pans out of the oven. Like I couldn't even grip wow. anything and the pain would be so bad. I couldn't even flip like a light pancake yeah. so bad. So then um, injections in my knees and I mean, and I'm terrified of needles. I sat on my mother's lap until I was 13 cause I was born with epilepsy. So I was at the doctors all right. the time uh, for many, many years. And I just did not like no needles. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, but I was in so much pain. I told him to do whatever needed to be done so that I can walk and serve my veterans. So, um, did that. And then, um, I just started doing a deep dive in to toxicity in, in the body and, um, inflammation. And, and so I, I went gluten-free and yeah. then I, I got rid of dairy and that changed a lot. And then I got rid of, uh, I went organic. And so I, I started looking at everything organic. I, I changed um, my uh, pads for my menstrual cycle. Mm. I changed my toothpaste. I changed my body wash. I changed, wow. I started changing out everything. And I started seeing like a, a remarkable difference. And my doctor, um, 
said, whatever you're doing, continue to keep doing it because my markers were going down. So then my, my, he started reducing the uh, prednisones and, um, and then mm -hmm. I was also on uh, sulfazine sulfazate and I was taking 500 milligrams three times, three or four times a day, like two pills, three, four times a day and, and nothing. Like I was still in so much pain mm -hmm. and I was so swollen. Like I would hurt so bad, like the top of my hair would hurt to the mm -hmm. bottom of my toes. I would be in so much pain some days that just to go from my front door to the alarm system, it would be going off. Like I would literally get out of my car and be crawling. Wow. And it got to the point I was trying to find somewhere for my dog to go. Cause I was, I mean, I was having suicidal thoughts. Like I was like, yeah. this is it. This is, I'm, I'm dying, I'm dying. <laughs> I couldn't come up my steps for weeks. I would just be hand washing myself and going to, it was so bad. It was so bad and nobody knew it because I'm all the way out here in West Virginia with yeah. no family. Um, so nobody knew this. the struggles that I, you know, and you call and I'm like, oh, I'm good, you know, because mm. I had so much pride and so much, you know, I, I didn't want to burden nobody, you mm. know, and then I didn't want to hear somebody say, people say, well, you need to just move or you just, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just didn't want to hear the negativity. So everything was, I'm good. I'm a, yeah. I was always good. I was always good. So when people hear this, they're going to be really <laughs> shocked yeah. at, at this story that I'm telling, but. Um, wow. Yeah, and no. also, also, what are people going to say? Like, go to the doctors, go get another drug. Maybe they have you on the wrong drug. Like most people are not going to say like, Hey, you know what? Can I come over and help you cook some healthy meals? Or like, what if we took away, you know, some other unhealthy foods that weren't serving you and introduced like healthier, you know, what are people going to say? So I totally get that. Right. And yeah. And you naturally look like somebody like you're a helper, you're a healer. You, you don't want to burden others because you're too busy helping others. Right. So I get that. Um, not sharing the pains with others. Um, so Okay, so you cut out gluten, you cut out dairy. What made you do that? Like, did you watch it? Did you read a book? Did you watch a documentary? Did you search something on the internet? Because most people wouldn't think to do that first. They would go see a shaman before they cut out the dairy and the gluten. Yeah, so uh, supersize me, what right. the health, um, uh, all of those uh, forks over knives. Okay, so you had watched some documentaries on this. Yeah. Yeah. Meet your meat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> good one. <laughs> that instantly turned, oh, totally turned me off of eating anything right. or eat meat. But um, yeah, so then when I think, I can't remember which one it was, but it, it was really focused on uh, keto. Yeah. And it was like somebody that could, a child that couldn't talk and it was epileptic people and it was people who were yeah. about to die. And so I tried keto. You know, so how did that go? That. And that made me lose weight, but it inflamed me. I yeah. was in more pain. I was in so much pain, but I wasn't, I wasn't putting it together because I'm losing weight and the doctor totally. was proud with me losing weight and everything. Yeah. I was like, something's not right. And then the Atkins man died and like, this is pretty much him. And I'm like, well, he didn't die. Like, this is not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, and this is crazy because when I saw this, when I saw keto come out, because I knew all about Atkins and I knew people who had done the Atkins diet. And I remember like 15, 20 years earlier, it not working for them. Like it's great for losing weight, really good for making you very sick and clogging your arteries. And, and, and it was interesting though, because people, you know, announced keto, like it was this brand new invention, but I'm like, wait a minute, like, are you forgetting about Atkins and the fact that he died? And, you know, but people weren't putting that together. They were just so excited about this new weight loss piece. And that's the problem is doctors love weight loss. The minute they see anybody who's sick, the first thing they go is just lose some weight as though it's so easy to lose weight. First of all, like one of the hardest things to do is to lose weight and keep it off. But then, you know, so they don't care how you're losing weight. Like you could be starving yourself, not eating enough calories, doing keto, which is making, but they're happy that you're losing weight. Meanwhile, your inflammatory markers are going up. Your arteries are getting clogged. Your mental health is suffering even more. Like it's, it's crazy. Our system is 
not designed for true health. Yes. It's like yes. an and image of health. You, yes. And I remember you talking about when we was on a that short phone call and I was telling you how I have a lot of family members that swear by keto. Like you open up their cabinets and it's completely covered yeah. in keto products. And I remember you saying something, you know, about uh, all of the health um, issues that that will come from doing the keto. And I yeah. was like, well, I hope she hits on that so that they can hear it because nobody believes me. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> changing family are like, they're the one of the hardest people on the planet to change. Yeah. So let me, I'm going to send a message right now to your family. Okay. Cause I want them listening to this podcast and I'm going to say, Kena Washington's family. Okay. And everybody else who's listening to this podcast out there. Let me tell you that the evidence is very conclusive when it comes to people doing keto within one year, okay, of having unclogged arteries, okay, and then you start keto, you can get 98% clogging, full clogging in your arteries, 98%. So that's when your arteries just like become more confined and filled with plaque and filled with, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's awful. So not only what it does to your arteries, but it gives you fatty liver disease. So it coats your liver because your liver can't process as that much fat. Um, you're also depriving yourself of fiber because of the fact that meat has zero fiber in it. If you just look at fiber and chicken, fiber and fish, fiber and meat, red meat, a fiber and anything, there's zero fiber versus all the fiber that you have in all these beautiful plant-based products. So now you've put so much protein, so much fat, usually it's all covered in salt as well. And your body can't process out this high amounts of fat and protein without having beautiful fiber that comes from the plant-based food, but you're not making room for it because all you care about is the fat and the protein and you don't want the carbs but listen to me, your brain health, your mental health is going to suffer. You're going to trigger Alzheimer's. And that is conclusive in the medical literature. You do a keto diet, you are going to bring on Alzheimer's and dementia faster than anything you've ever seen before. And because your micro capillaries get clogged and because you don't have the carbohydrate and all the beautiful sugars that come from eating plant-based food, you need that to fuel your brain. So your brain's going to literally shrivel up and you're not going to be able to clear out all the plaque from your brain. And this is what's going to happen to you. And we can turn this on and off through plant-based food. So we turn this on through high fat, high animal products, or we can turn it off by eliminating those and bringing in the plant-based food. And so if you want to see somebody reverse a disease faster than like, you can say my name, Nicolette Richet, you just switch to a plant-based diet. So Kina's family, listen to Kina and mic drop okay so okay so let's get back to you because you were living proof that you were able like you have turned your health around you even told me that your brother i think is went on the keto diet and what happened to his, his walking something happened to his legs did he, you tell he's, on the, he's currently on the keto diet now <laughs> he's currently on the keto diet now and his, his walking is okay it's his uh his hands cramp up a lot on him yeah. Hands cramp up, and he's in the broadcast journalism. He's got a high-ranking position where he needs to write and type, yeah. and um, and I, I, you know, I I I worry about him, and I I try, uh, you know, I send videos and I, you know, send little messages, but I don't want to be a burden, you know. I don't want to feel like I'm forcing, but I just want them to. Um, I just want, yeah. I just want everybody to live and thrive. And I want us all to dance at our hundredth birthday. Like, yeah, I just exactly. want us to, I don't want to bury none of my brothers and sisters. I, I just don't, I don't want to do it. I, if I had known what I know now, my daddy would still be here. Mm -hmm. My uncle would still be here. My uncles, like my dad, my, my dad, uh, all, both his brother and his sister both died from cancer. One, mm -hmm. uh, uh, colon cancer. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what Uncle Rusty had, but um, you know, I I just I just want them all to, I just want people to survive. And food yeah. is medicine. It and, is medicine. You know, what we eat can heal us, and it and it and it doesn't take long. Our body wants to be healed. Yeah. My body wants to be healed, and when you're ready to do it, you can do it. And 
people say, uh, I'm not buying that organic stuff. It's only a couple more dollars more and it's saving yeah. your body. It's either buy the organic or buy a prescription, totally. you know, or, and then you're, and then some of them are getting food, food stamps or, or, you know, free money or why not go to Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Wegmans, you yeah. know, a, a nice store and buy quality food for your children. Like, I mean, for your body, like yeah. your body wants it, it craves it. And uh, I, I just, um, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> and you know what? It's, it's, it, it is so hard, I think, for people to understand this because we're not taught this in school, right? We're taught, like, even in my daughter's school, I talked about this in another podcast, they're teaching about sugar and they're comparing like a, ve a vegetable press juice and the amount of sugar in that compared to a diet Coke, which has like virtually zero. You cannot compare the two because one is number one, the sugar is with all the the delicious nutrients, like so many minerals. And sure, you're going to get a little bit more sugar because it's juiced. But the thing is, it, it doesn't compare. Your body processes it completely differently. But this is what's being taught in 2022 to my 10-year-old. So my 10-year-old now is coming home showing me labels. And I'm like, well, first of all, they should tell you that if it has a label, you probably shouldn't need it right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. eat the apple. The apple doesn't come with the label on it, right? Mother nature's label is the skin of the potato. Mother nature's label is the skin of the carrot. So let me just say one more thing to your brother. And I hope he's listening to this podcast. Okay. If he's already getting the cramping in his hands, he's not getting blood flow there. He's not getting oxygen. He's not getting nutrients and it's too much inflammation. So that chronic inflammation is compressing the nerves. And if he does this for much longer, he's going to end up with neuropathy. So this is permanent nerve damage. And this is what happens to people with diabetes, right? They get permanent nerve damage. And so this leads to amputation of the limbs. So he's got to stop doing what he's doing right now. And he's got to turn that all the way around. The only way to stop that inflammation is to bring in high nutrient foods that are going to help the body detoxify, that's going to help the body clean out. The other thing, you talk about cancer in your family, right? So it would sound like genetically you're predisposed to cancer, but I'm going to tell everybody this, genetically we're all predisposed to cancer because we have genes that need to be turned on and off that help keep our body free of cancer. The minute you mess with that by giving your body the wrong nutrients, not enough nutrients and tons of protein, tons of fat, tons of salt, tons of refined sugar. Now you're going to flip the switches on those genes and you are going to now allow cancer to thrive in your body. So the only way to turn that off as well is to go back to eating the way people have eaten for millions of years and stayed relatively cancer free. And that is by eating real clean food and organic food is critical to that because of the fact that you don't have all those pesticides and all those pesticides and herbicides, fertilizers, insecticides, they cause cancer. This is conclusive evidence. We know this. Okay. So for anybody who's listening to this, especially Kina's family, listen to what Kina's doing and say it. So let's, let's just go back to the, the proof is literally in the whole foods, plant-based pudding. So let's go back to what happened with you. So you're developing all of this. You can't work. Okay. Yeah. You're, it's really like impacting your work. So then what you read, watch these documentaries. Okay. Now you start taking out the gluten and the dairy. Your doctor is like, keep doing what you're doing. So if the doctor's telling you to do what you do, the family should also <laughs> listen. Yeah. No. So then what happens after this? You're on prescription meds? Yeah. So, so the, the prescription medication is starting to dwindle down, but, but before it starts to, so I'm the steroids, he's been cutting me off the steroids, but he still has the sulfazine sulfazate up because I'm still in uh, pain. Like I couldn't, I couldn't even bend my hands for a long time. Like they were so big and my wrist, everything like mm -hmm. was so much pain. So he was like, I know you don't like needles, but we're going to have to do an infusions. That's the last resort. You don't want the injections. You don't want this and that. The last resort is the infusions. So then I started getting infusions. And so I've been getting infusions for about a year, but they are dwindling down. Like I, I believe in my heart that I'm healed. And mm -hmm. that I'm done with infusion. So 
they did now push my infusions out way further now. Like they were every eight weeks and now I'm 12 weeks and now I'm feeling really good. So now they're going to pull it back uh, uh, some more. So, you know, they just can't just stop it. Mm-hmm. But I'm about to be, so I'm not on any medication no more. Wow. I, I, yeah, so October, I decided to take my mom to Ocean City, Maryland. She had never been to Ocean City, Maryland, and we grew up in Maryland. <laughs> and so <laughs> I took her there in October and I forgot my medication by accident. And I felt great. October 4th is the last time I've had some sulfazine sulfazate. Wow. And uh, I've been feeling amazing. And yeah, and so I, I, I declare and I decree that I'm going to be done with infusions before the end of the year. That is amazing. And, I'm going to be completely done. and so when you first started, this, this is beautiful because this is what is possible. Like what the story you were sharing is exactly the story that, you know, my clients experience is that they're on all of these medications. They change their diet. They doctors take, I don't take them off their medications. Like I'm not going to prescribe and diagnose, but their doctors are like, you don't need these medications anymore. Or the ones that need like upcoming brain surgery or hysterectomies, or um, like, it doesn't matter what it like, they don't need those surgeries anymore. They're able to keep their organs in place where they belong in your body, not in a, you know, incinerator. And so like what you're doing is it happens all the time with my clients. And so, so with this though, I remember you telling me when we were in the, you were in the car that day, you know, your kids had just arrived, but you're telling me the story of um how you first kept in the fish right like when you started cutting out like all the meat because now you don't eat any meat right Mm -hmm. yeah so you cut out the gluten the dairy and then meat took a little bit longer tell me about that yeah so i so i had stopped the chicken and the and the pork back and and all of that back in like the late 90s early 2000s but I couldn't give up seafood because like, that's a Maryland thing, like crab feast and, and shrimp. And oh, I just loved it so much. <laughs> but I, I, I knew that I needed to, you know, start weaning it off. So I did start, you know, transitioning when I started learning about everything and started moving into organic stuff in my home and, and, and my body. I started just buying wild caught shrimp and wild caught salmon and mm-hmm. um, all of that kind of stuff. But, uh, it was uh, December 31st, 2020, when I said, this will be my last piece of seafood. And so I went into 20, and so that's the last time I had a piece of seafood was, um, and I had a seafood feast on New Year's Eve. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't had a, I haven't had a piece, I haven't had a piece since. And I, and I feel great. And I don't, I don't miss it because um, I did try, you know, like some fake, stuff mm. I rather just don't even I don't even want to deal with it <laughs> like, yeah. I'm good without it <laughs> well because it's also that's the thing we live in this world where we're transitioning all of this um you know the, the this meat products into fake meat products and that's just substituting one toxicity for another toxicity right like I would actually rather people ate a little tiny bit of meat versus a lot of these fake like synthetic meat products. Like I have a friend here who makes um, beautiful uh, fake salmon, but it's made with carrots. And when I first met her and she started making this, I was like, "Mm, I don't know. It's got all these preservatives in there. I can't do that. Like, but now I've seen how like now she's managed to get it down to like using real like vinegars and everything to preserve it versus all the synthetic preservatives. And so if you're eating fake meat like that, then I'm okay with that. Like there's certain things you can do. And now we're using mushrooms, for example, like last night I had a really nice dinner out with a friend and it was, you know, oyster mushrooms. And it was amazing because I love seafood too. And it is the one thing that I do miss, but I don't miss the toxicity from the oceans that get into the seafood that get into my body exactly exactly yeah Yeah, see that's what I had to and that like uh a friend of mine the other day she says I just got the worst headache she says is it because I'm changing my diet and I said I said yeah and I said you know and then I tried to explain to her and then she was she was asking me where do I get my protein yes a famous question totally. and I was trying to explain to her like most animals these big animals are herbivores like 
I said, you've never seen uh, the cow eating another cow. You've never seen a group, you know, like, and they are big and strong. So you got to, it first starts in the mind. Like you yeah. have to change your mindset. And that's what took me. I had to change my mindset. And then when I think about the pain that the animal went through and then I'm digesting it and like mm -hmm. that just completely turned mm -hmm. me off. Like, and you know, when you really connect with that, like this, this cow is being taken away from her babies and, you know, and she's being injected to make her meat fuller or to make the chicken wings bigger and mm -hmm. like those big old jumbo wings that's coming from China and you bite into it and burst the juice like I remember all of that like yeah. I'm just so I could oh god <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it no more yeah. but yeah. you know but when you think about the torture and the pain that the animals went through and then you're ingesting that yeah and then you're in now you're feeling the pain of that animal. Like that's what I that's what I told her the other day. <laughs> like yeah. that's yeah, I just can't, I just can't do it. I could never see myself going back to eating meat. And people ask me all like, no, uh, I, I just can't, I just can't do it. And yeah. I just wish um to go back to when we were talking about diabetes and stuff. A lot of my family members that are diabetic, they don't eat no fruit. Mm -hmm. They don't eat no potatoes because the doctor tell them that that's what's raising their blood sugar. Yeah. I'm like, you got to eat this. You got to eat the potatoes. You got to eat the vegetables. Yeah. You got to stop putting the meat in it. You got to stop putting that grease in it. You well, that's the thing. Yeah. And that's the miss. That's the unfortunate, like severe miscommunication that is making people very, very sick right now because it's transitioned people away from the high fiber, carbohydrate, rich foods that are full naturally of sugar, but that's not what makes your blood sugar spike. And on the opposite side, it is the fat that is doing it from all these animal products. And it's also the protein because the protein creates the acidity in the body, which then breaks down the body. But it's the fat that triggers this accumulation of pack, plaque in our arteries. And then the insulin and glucose can't get across the cell wall and get taken up in the tissues where our tissues need it because that it needs to create energy so we can heal. So everybody that I come across that exactly like that like and, and mom she has a 10 year old daughter who just got diagnosed with diabetes same thing she's like has cut her daughter off all fruit all potatoes all starches and giving her like keto diet and I'm like oh my god this 10 year old is doomed 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 but we she's been raised the mom's been raised to think exactly like this like don't eat potatoes so what I want to know is how my clients who have type two diabetes for 20 years, insulin injections, how we immediately on day one, put them on potatoes, carrots, squash, and juices, and all this food like vegetable juices, which are high in sugar, and how in the first week, their medication has come down by more than 50%. By day 30, they're off all their meds. Tell me how that works. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. This is what yeah. I'm saying. And I, and when, so when I first, so when the pandemic hit, that's when like everything shut down and I was always working three jobs and mm -hmm. um, serving other people and going and, and volunteering and everything. And then the world shut down and it just really made me, I've been in my house since I got my house built in 2007. That's what brought me to West Virginia. I couldn't afford not a piece of a sidewalk in DC mm. and and um this lady from my job I started in the government at NIH and she told me that her and her um son had just put down down payments and they were both getting their own houses built out in West Virginia I was like West Virginia and she was like it's only an hour away and you know if you didn't get on the beltway that's what they call the the highway in, in the DC area, if you didn't get on there within 15 minutes, uh, our 15 minute drive took you over an hour to go to your regular 15, 30 minute ride in rush hour traffic. Like rush hour started in the DC area about 2.30 and you are still on that beltway to about eight o'clock. Like it was so bad. Wow. It was so, it's so bad. <laughs> so I think they're the second or third world uh, worst traffic area in the United States. Oh <laughs> so uh, an hour was nothing to drive to West Virginia. So I went, so she, I said, well, bring me in the information because they were getting like five bedroom houses built and stuff. And I was like, I don't need all of that. But mm -hmm. I had made, again, like, like moving to New York, I kept saying by my 30th birthday, I'm going to own a home wow. by my 30th birthday. 
And so she brought me the info. So I, my mother and them had just sold it. So that's when the market in 2006 was selling really fast. And my mother and them house sold for like a hundred thousand more. And it sold within three days. That's when the signs would say, I can sell your house in 24 hours and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. My mother's house is sold and they were out and they were gone. And, um, uh, and so everybody had left. So my uncle had just died in 2005. So that was just like a life changing experience. Cause that was like my father's best friend and my aunt. So then my aunt decided to buy land in Virginia where they were born at. And so my mother and them bought uh, two acres of land and they got a house built down there. Wow. And so they left uh, from where we've been living for almost 40 years, uh, moved down to back down to my father's home place and my aunt moved down there. And so I was like, well, bring me in the information. So my mother had given me a couple dollars from selling a house. So I was paying off my credit. And every time the lady kept telling me, you know, pay this off, pay this off, pay this off. And so uh, she brought me the information and, and I typed the man 24 hours. They told me I was approved for a townhouse. And I was like, what? Like, I don't even know where I'm moving to. And I ain't got approved. What? And so I was like, okay. So he was like, let's set up an appointment so you can choose your plot, you know, your model, yeah. your, uh, how you want it. What? Like, Look at God. <laughs> and when I kept on saying, I'm going to have a house by my 30th birthday. And so I came up here and this was before you, if you didn't have a Tom Tom or a Garmin, you had to print off MapQuest. So this thing took me around from DC, around some country, Barney Fife, scary, don't get out the car, don't look <laughs> left to right, um, like looked like a barrel of hay was going to go down the road, like scary. And I was like, I'm not moving out here. So when, as soon as I pulled up to the model home and she opened the door, hi, I said, ma'am, if this is the only way to get to this house, I don't even want to see the model because that was the scariest, right? She's like, oh, did you print off MapQuest? That's the worst direction. She's like, I don't know why I took you that way, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So then there's a train track. And I said, is that an active, um, train track and she was like oh no I know this lady had their scheduled meetings right around this train because this train track is very active <laughs> it's, very, it's very active and the way she took me back out was more you know a suburban like mm. and I didn't have to go back I don't know why that they took me off the highway and took me all these back roads but it was the scariest and so that was May like Memorial weekend and I got to choose my model and everything wow. and I got a house built and it was ready I turned that was May I turned 30 July I wow. signed the contract in May and my house was ready in August but I moved in on my dad's birthday September 18th I signed oh. yep I went to settlement on his birthday that yeah. is amazing yeah, so and you know and you there's something, there's something interesting about this too, because, you know, moving an hour away out of the city, but like, you know, having this development on a few hundred acres of land, like this is what people need that we have to go back to the land, right? Because the land is what heals. And so now you have all of this space around you, like I can even see green space behind you. And, mm -hmm. you know, and this is especially what communities and especially black communities need, because in so many communities, like there's no access to grocery stores. And they have, like, if anybody watches the, like, please find a way to watch, like, the video that just came out by John Lewis. Um, they're trying to kill us because it's really showing that, like, in suburban neighborhoods, in inner cities, in, you know, you can't even, like, grocery stores are banned from putting healthy food into these communities. And this is crazy because there's policies in place that are affecting people from having access to clean real food to fruits and vegetables but you can go to mcdonald's and you can put a mcdonald's in a like whatever fast food joint in any of these communities so this is like all that people are left with so in a way it's almost like i see this as such a blessing to be literally financially like the market has pushed people out of you know inner cities and cities to go back to the land it's like the opposite of what happened 450 years ago yeah. And so I, I, I just say all the time that God put me out here for a reason. Yeah. And so uh, being from the DC area, 
every Friday was fish fry Fridays. Mm -hmm. So you could go anywhere in the grocery store, anywhere, and you was going to find fried fish. And I come out here and I can't find, they don't even know what a carry out is out here. Like nothing. So in 2019, I, be, I started, March of 2019, I started um, um, Dora Catherine's. And it was supposed to be uh, serving fried fish and fried chicken to the community. Mm -hmm. And so I had never worked where I lived at. So even after I moved out here, I didn't enjoy my house. I didn't come mm -hmm. to stay in my house. So I was off every other weekend at, at NIH and every other weekend I would come home. Like I never got to stay in here because that's when the um, market crashed in 2008 and gas prices, it was like $600 mm -hmm. to fill up my tank um, because it was a half a tank a day that I was spending because right. I was I was doing 3,000 miles a month. Wow. And so I was literally sleeping in my car and I would go upstairs in the bathroom to wash up because I couldn't even enjoy my own house. Wow. I was paying a mortgage but couldn't even come in into it. Yeah. And I would, uh, so a doctor from the a VA um, decided uh, she she was looking for a room to rent. And so she, I didn't even see her. And she pretty much had access to the whole house because uh, mm. I wasn't, I wasn't here to enjoy my own, right. my own home. So when the pandemic hit, like I became, I started to uh, explore rooms and pull out stuff that I hadn't seen and mm. start to do stuff that I hadn't done in, in a long time, because it just, it was like a re, um, connection. Yeah. Reset my, reconnection. Myself. It was, uh, it was pretty deep. It was pretty deep. So I, wow. Was, yeah. Yeah. So then, so then throughout all of this, like you're sick and then you're healing and you're getting off all these meds and, you know, you're going to be on like off the last amount, like hopefully by the end of this year. And I can't wait to celebrate that. Yeah. So then when did you become a plant-based chef? So, so, so that began, I want to say it's just been a transitional period thing. So I started in 2019. That was when I started getting rid of the, uh, I, I got, I watched this movie called Dark Waters and that mm. was really scary. So I went through and I, anything that wasn't BPA free, like my aunts and them swear by a country cock uh, a tub and you open it up and it's not no butter in there. It's yeah. like leftover food. And my father and my aunts and all of them, they would go, they would take the water bottles like that they bought uh, at the store and they would drink it, but then they keep on filling it up from the sink water. And I'm like, this is so dangerous. And mm -hmm. I even bought the BPA free cups with the filters in them. Nope, but I'll still find that water bottle <laughs> that they have filled up from the sink in the freezer yeah. or anything like that. And and I and I threw away all nonstick pans. I, I, I ordered, I started, you know, when people ask me, what did I want for Christmas? I told them I wanted all stainless steel yeah. pots and pans. And I wanted, I just started just revamping. I've got all these mason jars and I started, you know, just changing. And I had a really bad issue with my cycle that I would have clots like the size of my hand. But once I switched to, to um, I mean, the, the pain from, the, from eighth grade all the way up, I always had to miss a day out of school a month, always. Yeah. Like I would be in a ball and I remember my father would come and he just said, he just wished that he could take away my pain. Like the pain mm -hmm. would be so bad. And you know, you doubling your pants and you have two pairs of underwear and you got, you didn't line the pads cause they didn't make them that long back then. Yeah. So you got to <laughs> the front to the back. Like, you know, and somebody said, you got a spot. Like you're just yeah. in so much pain and so much embarrassment. Yeah. But once I switched, once I got rid of dairy, and once I stopped eating, oh, it was pretty much dairy was a big culprit. Oh, but yeah. then like seven days, like there was a big change. And I remember right before COVID uh, it was when I stopped dairy. And I remember just, I was so sick yeah. that and you know, after we learned about COVID, I was like, I probably had COVID. Like we know we had COVID because that's how bad the mucus was. Like yeah. I was so 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 sick but um i switched to organic pads and stuff man my cycle went from 
it was always three days, but that word first day was yeah. always through the night was always the worst. But then it just got to the point, like it wasn't even bad. Like I could just wear a regular. Yeah. So you knew that the, and I try and tell family members that have really bad cycles yeah. uh, that you need to switch, you know, but they don't want to hear it from me. I know. But like, it's such a, it's such a game changer. It's, it's such a, a game changer. It is a game changer. And I went through the same thing that for me, I like would have to go home. I get hot and cold flashes, such terrible cramping for two days, blood clots, like unbelievable, exactly the same story. And then in my early twenties, I switched it's like predominantly more, I was still eating a bit of meat back then, but like, like 90% vegetables, 10% meat, not every day, cut out all the dairy. I switched immediately. Um, and back then I switched to like soy milk or rice milk or whatever, but now I just like, you know, I make my own milks through like a little bit of, you know, oats in the blender with water and rice in the blender with water. And you can make your own stuff and 20 seconds um you know but once I switched to again getting away uh, rid of all organic all plant-based um getting rid of all the plastics as well like same thing like no more um like all these chemicals and now it's crazy like I have not had a period cramp in 20 something years and people said well it's because you had babies but I'm like no they stopped before I had babies and I had babies but but for me there's been a few times when I've had like many months of like not eating well. And that doesn't mean me eating meat, but it's like, I'm kind of like missing a lot of meals and not eating and like maybe eating more chips and not sleeping well. And the stress comes on. And immediately the first thing that happens is I'll see a little tiny blood clot and I'll feel not a period cramp, but like tension. Like for me, tension along, you know, might cross my uterus. And that for me is like red flags going up. Like if I get that, I'm like, Nikki, get back on your health, you know, and really focus on that. And so I know I can create those blood clots again, just by my lifestyle. I know it and by my diet. So, but other people, it's like you and I, before we knew this, like we were accepting like missing days of work and school and massive blood clots and chronic pain. But now I do not accept any of that. So it's like, I always say, like, don't shoot the messenger, right? The minute you shoot the messenger, like take the Tylenol for the cramps, right? Or miss a day of work because you appear, that's shooting the messenger. That's your body telling you, hey, stop what you're doing. What you're doing right now is causing these symptoms. You got to stop that and do something different but as opposed to taking the drug, taking the medication, the surgery, the everything stops shooting the messenger. So I can speak to that. And I can also speak to that because my clients get exactly the same results around there. The first thing that happens within the first month of doing this, no more period pain. In fact, they wake up covered in blood because they don't even realize their period's coming. Yeah. They're like, what just happened? Yeah. I had no warning. <laughs> yep. Same here. That's what that's been happening to me. Yeah. That's what's been happening to me. It's, it's so amazing. It's so amazing. So, so this, so, so I, so on Thanksgiving, I, I'm really busy with a lot of catering and stuff. And so, but a lot of people eat a lot of meat. And so um, I told people, I've been gradually telling people because I've been getting a lot of requests mm. for proms and graduations and uh, family reunions lately. And I've been turned like just even last night, I turned down one. Um, wow. Cause I just don't want to pollute my community no more. I just, I'm, I just don't want to pollute my community no more. I just can't do it. I just wow. can't do it. I just can't do it. And so uh, my friend Liam, they opened up a Puerto Rican vegan uh, about 20 min minutes away. And then another friend, uh, Jason and uh, Hope, they opened up uh, like a fast food vegan restaurant. And then another a guy, he uh, Kelly's Farm, they, they have, he has a couple, a couple uh, raw stuff on it but that's about it on his menu yeah um but nobody is offering what i want to offer yeah and i want to i want to i want to heal our community and yeah. i want to offer and in good nature that's like a little grocery store it looks like a house with the porch but it's a grocery store in the front organic and then in the back they they do food and they do like a co-op groceries mm -hmm. also in there which is very nice but still nothing raw, like they have a salad on there. Uh, but I want it, but nobody's doing juices. Everybody yeah. does smoothies, 
But what I want to offer is um, a juice bar yeah. with like uh, uh, with more raw options. But then I want some vegan soul food. Yes. And I want to do which, uh, which you can 100 percent. Oh yeah. my God. That's amazing. And you can offer vegan. Like this is the, this is the issue is that I know in a lot of communities, like we have to look at the food that we're eating culturally. Right. So if you were born and raised and eating, you know, a lot of this comfort Southern cooking, like I get that you're going to want that because your grandmother made it, but her grandmother probably didn't eat that. Her grandmother probably ate like my grandmother. And so, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. You've been raised with that, that cultural attachment, the memory of eating that food, but we we can still create that. Like last night I had the most amazing meal that could be considered Southern, you know, comfort food, but it was going to heal you, not harm you. So we can that. do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We don't have to give, we can still give people what they want, but it doesn't have to be the deep fried version or covered in preservatives. And, you know, yeah. we can do it. You yeah. are, you are doing like such important, incredible work. And you are going to be raising the bar for all of those other places that you just mentioned as well. Like when you start offering that and turning down those catering requests and saying, yes, you're going to be raising the bar for these other people and making it even easier for you to do your work. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, I, everything, I, everything is just all connecting mm -hmm. me getting connected with you and I'm working on this certification and, and then I, I'm also working on a, um, a, a minority black owned women certification, small business certification so that wow. I can get grants and stuff because I, there's a need for me and I just want to heal my community. I, one person at a time. I just, yeah. I just, yeah, I just want to, that, that's just where, where my heart is going. So like when I created Dora Catherine's in March of 2019, I wasn't vegan. I was still eating seafood, but there was a need for fried fish and chicken. And then I said, um, uh, for Lent, I was going to give up seafood. So I started in January, I started eating out all of, you know, all of the, my cabinet, I started eating out all of the food out of my freezer and I wasn't going to buy it no more. And, but I had stopped the dairy first. And yeah. so then the pandemic hit, uh, during, during that uh, March. And so I want to say, yeah, because my brother's birthday was March the 12th and we were doing him a 40th and that's when Lent had just started and my sister mm -hmm. was like, I don't know what you're going to eat because, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I'll, I'll be fine. Then there was no meat in the stores and then, you know, and then it was all vegetables. Yeah. And, and, and then, um, and I remember for 57 days straight, I prepared my own meals. Wow. And I got to meet my farmers and they had drive by a uh, farmer's market. And that was the first time that I got to get out here in my community and meet personally, shake mm -hmm. their hand and learn about mushrooms and herbs and how to cook this and how to do that. Oh, it was the 2020, the pandemic was like a blessing to me. Yeah. You know, it was, it was bad for some and we lost a lot of people, but Mm -hmm. It was an uh, eye opener. I, I never knew about Tabitha. My sister tried to show me about Tabitha Brown, but I thought she was funny. But then, you know, she became my best friend because all I had was my laptop, you know, on my yeah. cell phone. And I'm on this journey. And so let me see what she's doing. And boy, I mean, and she skyrocketed. I mean, she was just like a nobody to, yeah. she's now America's mom. You yeah. know, <laughs> like, no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, she's she's a pretty phenomenal, and her 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 daughter is my personal trainer. Her her um step her bonus daughter, Talia. Bonus daughter, I love that. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, no, I've been following her as well. She's amazing. Tabitha Brown, we'll put her link down below as well. Um, I love this journey that you have been on. We are going to wrap this up, but what I want to know is. Where can people continue to be inspired by you? Where do you want to send them to? So I have a YouTube channel that I created in January called I Am Key Washington on YouTube, I'm on Instagram, uh, Facebook. And I have a website that is currently I don't know, under construction because I now have a new focus and goal, but DoraCatherines.com. 
Amazing. So we're going to put all the links down below in the show notes. And one thing that I want to just put out to everybody there is, you know, when you had reached out, you wanted to see if you can do our nutrition and detox training program. I mean, of course, you had set the appointment before two little babies showed up in your life that you have brought into your home as a foster mama. Um, But we want to support you in taking this nutrition and detox training program because more than ever, um, people need to understand the science of food as medicine they need to know how to do it so the art you have you are the artist already because you are the culinary chef and you already know so much of the science and so we want to help you just elevate it to the next level so that you can work with clients who have diabetes and heart disease and cancer and autoimmune disorders and you can actually support them through um, this healing you know you're going to learn everything in this so that you can launch a business fully and take on, on clients you're already doing such great work for the for the federal government, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, cooking for the veterans there, which is awesome. So we want to help you do all of that. So we're going to give you like 100% full scholarship for that program. Get out of here. Yes, 100%. You are living proof that food as medicine works. You are living proof that, you know, you are of service to your community in the utmost way. And um, we just need to create an army of healers like yourself. So we're going to support you in doing that. God is so good. Thank you so much. Mm. Yes. And we'll work with you so that I know you have a lot on your plate right now with these babies. So we'll just continue to work with you so that, you know, you don't have to like, we'll, we'll manage the time with you so you can do this as well oh thank you bless you thank you for you and your whole team no thank you honestly like you you are you are an angel in this world in your community like you are you know you're going to be saying you are saving people's lives with this information so um and just you taking the time to be on our show as well has been like such a huge blessing because you've opened up You've shined the light on so many important issues that are happening in communities across the United States and across Canada and across Australia. Um, and, and all of this, all of this can change and it is changing because of people like you. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Oh, what a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much more I wanted to share, but thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, well, we can just do another show because you, I can see you being back on the show so many times because you're going to have so many stories to tell. But let's let's give you this opportunity. Like, what is one gold, like, or one to three things that if anybody has an illness out there, if anybody is eating foods that are causing harm to them, causing contributing to their illness, what are three things that you can share with them to get started? Don't put so much pressure on yourself. Uh, be easy on yourself. Don't, uh, it, you know, you didn't get this way overnight. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen overnight. Just, uh, you know, um, just take it one step at a time. Like I said, you know, eat out your, your refrigerator and uh, don't throw away anything and just make more conscious decisions and your food choices and mm. to seek the best medical care and, you know, if get a second opinion and, you know, you only get one body and you are your best advocate mm. and keep good notes on yourself. And, um, and, you know, you can do it. You can do it. If I can yeah. do it, you can do it. I was 285 and I'm, I'm coming down, um, and, and it's, you know, it's been a process. It's a slow process, but it's, um, it's worth, it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, you're going to get a lot of haters. Nobody's going to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, especially in our community where they like to feed you and they want to see you eat the food and they want you to try it. You bring your own stuff to the, to the cookout, to the reunion and don't tell them what's in it and just let them try it. I make the best potato salad. Anybody will tell you. I make the best macaroni and cheese, hands down. And uh, you, I, nobody knows that there's not any um, dairy in that. They don't miss the eggs in it, you know? Mm. Uh, yeah. So just, uh, yeah, just, you, everything will be just fine. And where's my mama? Everything will be just fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much for being on the show. We're going to make sure that everybody gets access to you um, and the beautiful work that you're doing. And um, I can't wait to have you on the show again so we can continue to talk through. There's so much more to talk about in all of these yeah. areas. Yeah, I didn't get to talk about the boys and stuff, but they, they came in pretty much vegan. So they, they don't like meat. <laughs> they like everything and there's not one piece of fruit that the baby don't eat that wow. the five-year-old don't eat and uh they just love they love everything that i make and they love they just love eating and, and this is this yeah, is one of the most important things ever is that because these children that are in your home these boys they are the next generation like they are the next they are the leaders right? That the, the right now they're little, but in 10, 15, 20 years from now, like they're going to be out there. They're going to also be having their own children, maybe probably. And so it is so important right now that parents, um, you know, and caregivers and guardians that they are introducing these healthy foods to the palates of these children, because if they, if the only thing they know is packaged processed food, and if the only thing they know is meat and dairy, then they're going to have an affinity to that. They're just going to want to eat that all the time. And they will not like the, the textures of the fruits and flavors. So that what you're doing is incredible to give them access to all of these different fruits and vegetables. You are wired, like you're literally wiring their brains for success. Thank you. In Thank the world. you. Thank you. That, that means a whole lot to me. That means a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they were, they would definitely pick just for me because I could have got some, you know, chicken nugget eating, french fry. I mean, they've never even said, can we go to, they don't even, they, they don't even acknowledge yeah. it. We, I think we only had it one time in a couple months that they, they, I mean, and that was, uh, because there was not like it was just emergency. <laughs> yes, and I and I hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, they, eat, they eat home. We eat home cooked foods. Wow. Yeah. That is a beautiful, that's one of the greatest, greatest gifts that you can give to anybody is a beautiful home cooked, nutrient dense food, free of all the toxins that are out there. Like there's no better gift on the planet than that, because ultimately that's what provides health. So thank you for doing that for those boys oh, thank for yourself. You. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been the, oh, I'm just in awe. Like I don't, when I get off of here, I'm going to run. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to worry. Like I'm just so you know, like my feet is. Just, I'm just like a five year old right now. Oh. Like I'm so <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way because it's the potential that we're creating here with you and I and, the, you know, and what this means for the communities, like literally all around North America that just need to know this information. It's why I have this podcast to share the beautiful stories from incredible humans like yourself. So I want to yeah. just thank you for that. Yeah, you have no idea. Like my mind is just spinning. Like it's just a whole reason why I'm out here and I just mm -hmm. to buy my 40 acres and my mule and build a, a community co-op where I want veterans to have like a tiny house community where they can help wow. build their community. And we yeah. have a community-based uh, uh, chow hall where they're gonna wow. come in and we're gonna have animals that they'll just, you know, be able oh. to, for therapy and stuff. And like, I've always said that I'm gonna be on Oprah and now she has a whole channel. Who knows, I might have a chat, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I just can tell you to just keep saying it. And this might be what's going to lead me. Like I'm going to be right. the person that's going to, I just want to create and leave a, leave a legacy behind. Mm. And it's, and I know that this is the, the, where God is leading me to. Yeah. And he led me to you. <laughs> it's, well, about I to just, be, it's about to be big. Oh, it's about to be huge. And you know what you have already done, like what you have done to date is more than what so many other people have done. Like you have, a, like you could be like, and my work is done in the world because you have been the living proof that this actually works. And even just what you've done to like, you know, support people and catering, you know, with really healthy food. Like you, every time you do that, you are helping people um, transition and learn a little bit more. So it's, you know, I'm the same way. Like I know the vision that I have, which is so big. Like I want to have medical hospitals dedicated to this. And I want to have places where people who are so sick and can't make their own food that they can go and it's all made for them. And they just have to focus on sitting back and eating the food and healing, you know? So I have this idea, which makes me often go, Oh, what I've done is not enough, but you have done enough. 
you have done so much. So I just I hope that you remind yourself of that every day. And I think you're amazing. And I hope you don't forget that either. Thank you. We, you and I can just keep reminding each other of that. How about that? Yes. yes, yes. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Wasn't that a great show? This woman is incredible. Kina, we love you. Thank you for all you do in the world. And I can't wait to have you back on the show because as you get your business up and running fully, helping other people to heal through food as medicine, you are going to have so many more stories to share. So thanks for doing everything you do. And for those who don't know, we also launched a beautiful course called Decolonizing Your Plate. So this teaches you everything about the effects of colonization on your health, on your thinking, what it's done to you in your kitchen, but particularly how to reverse your chronic diseases by decolonizing your plate and your life. So head on over to our website, get on our mailing list so you can be notified of when we open up that course again. We have our current cohort running through the program. They are loving it and you will love it too. So get on the wait list so you know when we announce the next intake. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Becky, for editing our podcast, everything you do, being able to produce it each and every week so that our audience can have access to this beautiful information that all of our guests share with us and with you. See you next time.